Good afternoon. Hello, Serena Hines, Mr. Alvis. I just would like to know about uh, foreign opening uh, to Thai culture. How and how do we keep uh, the good way about Thai culture? And uh, if something changes, how should we do? Well, you see, I, I, I cannot give you a recipe, unfortunately. You, you have to take up the responsibility to work out a way how to build on the strengths of Thai tradition, of Thai history, of Thai society, and uh, based on these strengths, of the Thai culture, you have to assess uh, how in the best way this traditional Thai culture can contribute in building a new world order. So, of course, it's very, very difficult in the world today because, as I said, the attraction of the Western way of life, let's call it like this, is very strong. And I am not critical necessarily to this Western way of life, of course, because I'm coming from there, I'm part of it. But, you know, I have to make this maybe a little bit longer because I want to speak briefly in this context about human rights and the system of democracy first. You know, what are human rights? Human rights is nothing else than that we guarantee the minimum to human individuals so that they can live as human beings. If the this minimum is not guaranteed. That means human rights say that everybody is entitled for shelter, for food, for health service, for education, for water, sanitation, and to live in a certain dignity. And that these are the basic rights which we call human rights. Now, if you don't guarantee this to human beings, then you practically force them to live like animals. They cannot live in dignity as human beings. So this is the human rights. This is the minimum guarantee to the individual to live as human being. The democracy, the system of democracy is nothing else in my view than a mechanism to resolve conflicts. But therefore, it's so both of these concepts, yeah? Human rights on the one side and the system of democracy is very much linked with the Western philosophy, the Western way of living, because we in the West consider conflict actually as something positive. So we speak about conflict resolution, but it does not mean that conflict is something negative. For us in the Western world, disagreements or a clash of interest is something absolutely natural. This is the way business is conducted. This is the way of human rights on the one side and the system of democracy is very much linked with the Western philosophy, the Western way of living because we in the West consider conflict actually as something positive. So we speak about conflict resolution, but it does not mean that conflict is something negative. For us in the Western world, disagreements or a clash of interest is something absolutely natural. This is the way business is conducted, this is the way our personal life uh, is led, uh, that means I express freely and frankly my interests. I say I have this and that goals in life, I am pursuing this and that interests, and this I tell you now, and then you will tell me, okay, but I have these interests and that interest, and my goals are like this, 
and then we find out um, uh, that these goals, that these interests are either in competition or that they are not compatible. Yeah? So, therefore, because this is the way we act in the Western world, that we are individual centered and at the same time through this individuality we enter into a clash of interests and therefore we had to develop a system which resolved these conflicts and this is the system of democracy. So, in other words, democracy is an arbitration system and it's based on the rules that everybody, each party, political party, but each individual party has his or her own interests in pursuing the interests and not the public interest. And this is now when we speak about business, for instance, and public-private partnership and so on, then we see again these basic conflicts because business is profit-oriented. Business pursues the private interest, the partial interests, while politics should pursue the public interest and should be there for the common good. And so private and public interest usually is also entering in a conflict. And all these conflicts are normal in our societies. And again, democracy is a way to resolve these conflicts. Now, if I look to Asia, then we have a complete different situation. Because basically, some more, some less, but basically, Asian societies are conflict avoidance societies. So conflict in traditional Asian societies is regarded as something very negative. And everything what you in Asia are doing in everyday life permanently is to signalize to each other, I don't want to have conflict, therefore you act like you smile, you bow, and you say, hey, I don't want any conflict with you. I show you that my hands are no weapons, no conflict, please, you know? So, now, of course, for a culture which is based on conflict avoidance, conflict resolution, might look very different than in a culture where conflict is the daily bread. So, democracy is for sure, and human rights has a universal value. But the forms of the democracy which will be developed and will work out or crystallize uh, in the different cultures might look very different. So we can have basic features, but the institutions or the mechanisms might be very different. So again, we are at this point where I said either you become a Western culture, then, and this is, it looks right now that most of you young people, you are interested in video clips of this and that artist, you, you see how uh, you know, Eminem and uh, I don't know who, uh, uh, they are expressing themselves, you know, and this is uh, an extreme of individualism. And so many of the young people around the world say, hey, I want also to have this. I want to pursue my career. I want to express myself culturally and personally. And even I compete with others of my uh, age group and so on because I want to be the best and I want to be uh, the most accepted and the most loved and so on. So one way for Asian cultures is that you adopt more and more Western values and Western way of life and then probably also the democracy which you will have ultimately in your culture might look very Western or maybe you find another way but I cannot give you a recipe I just can point out these basic uh, uh, features but you as a society, as a culture, as a community you have to work this out you have to make up your mind and say hey 
what is my identity? What, how do I see the future of the world? How do I want to see a society here in Thailand developing uh, for my children and grandchildren? What should be the basic features? Shall it be capitalistic like the American capitalistic system? Shall it be a humanistic system? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, it's endless, but I just point you out a few points, yeah? So capitalistic system, says, for instance, that in the center of the system is the capital, yeah? And we humans have to serve the capital interest. This is capitalism. If you have a, a, a technocratic system, yeah? Then in the center is maybe science and technology, yeah? But then we humans basically have to serve uh, 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 science and technology. I'm personally in favor of a humanistic system. I want that the human being is in the center of society and that economy, that technology and so on is serving human beings to fulfill themselves and to make the best out of their human potential. So these are basic features um, and, and thoughts uh, to your answer and uh, I wish you that you continue to think and discuss this with your colleagues uh, and that you make up your mind and you find your own individual way as a culture and as a human being. Okay, um, sorry about the time and uh, I was told that we, we can explain our time more. So if you have more questions, Please come forward to the microphone. So I cannot see what you ask me, that this is a blurring of identities. In contrary, I keep my identity, you keep your identity, I see that you are um, a Thai, I'm a, a European, uh, uh, you have a certain age, I have a certain age, etc., etc. But that does not mean that we cannot work together harmoniously, that we cannot cooperate that we cannot be friends, that we don't want to make each other happy, and so on. So in contrary, coexistence is a way to respect the differences and the potential disagreements between us. So I respect fully that you are different, but yet I say this does not mean that I have to beat you and you have to beat me. You understand? Because I don't want that you are the same as me, and you hopefully don't want that I be the same as you, do you understand? So respect and respectful dialogue, cooperation, interaction, this is the basis of coexistence. So you keep your identities, you preserve your identities, you you develop your potential in your own way and we do it together. So it's a form of co-evolution, you know? We help each other to evolve, to become more mature. We inspire each other in our difference. Because if we would be all the same, it would be not very inspirational, you know? Uh, so 
out of this coexistence, co-evolution, uh, and the handling of differences and disagreements in this way, something new will appear as synthesis of our positions, a synthesis of our cooperation. You know, we create something new. And this is maybe to finish this remark. You see, this is the fascinating part of love. Now I speak more about the, the romantic aspect of love. Because love is doing something which is very strange. It takes away our identity on one level. You know, if you are really in love, you lose yourself, they say, yeah? You get crazy, yeah? You, you don't know who you are anymore because you are obsessed with this other being, yeah? You, you, you are doing like this, I'm sure you have experienced it already. <laughs> Otherwise, you would not agree so much. So, you, you lose yourself, you know? So, now, love takes away our identity. But at the same time, it makes us feel great. It makes us feel unique. It brings us a lot of joy, yeah? So, suddenly we understand that this is an interesting model. Because on, on the one level, love, if we enter into this state, it takes away our old identity. But on a higher level, it gives us a new identity, and this is the identity of the two loving beings together. So, the mathematics of love is that out of oneness, singleness, you take away the identity of the singleness, and you become two, in a two-ness which is a oneness, yeah? It sounds a little stupid, maybe, what I say, but I think you get, uh, you, you get it. You understand? So, suddenly, two are becoming one, and they create together a new identity. And therefore, I say it's a very interesting model, on many levels, this model of love. Because if we, as I said earlier, if we enter into a culture of love, then we understand that we, all human beings, we might lose our identity in the process of this globalization, but if we handle it the right way, we will receive another identity as a human family on a higher level, and this human family is united in love. And this would be the model. In, in our society, we have a tight saying about, about love. If one falls in love, you know, that person can be a blind. So love makes one a blind because the person is upset with, with the one who he or she loves. At least it makes us blind for a short time, maybe not forever. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any other question? Here we have uh, one question. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Kanyala. I'm a sophomore studying business English. My question is, how should we react to people who are prejudicial to us? Thank you very much. Who are prejudiced? Yes. Okay. You see, basically, again, if you, so to speak, enter into a conflicting situation, there are three major ways to respond. The first one is aggressiveness. Yeah, if you enter into such a situation and somebody um, is prejudiced to you and makes fun about you um, and uh, denies you respect and so on, um, then of course, but this is more just in brackets, it's the cowboy way, yeah? You take out your gun and you shoot, yeah? Say, go out of my way, yeah? So, 
the one way to react is aggressiveness. Of course, I'm not promoting this. Another way is, I don't know now the right English word, but that you duck it out, yeah? That you kind of ignore it. That you say, well, um, uh, I cannot handle this situation, so I just don't react and I act as if this would not happen. Yeah, many people are doing this in conflicting situations that they say, well, I, I just go away or I duck it out, I feel I, I should not, uh, I don't want to enter into a conflict. The third way is that you address it and that you negotiate it, that you enter into a dialogue, yeah? that you find, and this is what we can call diplomacy. You know, this is what our uh, ambassador is doing his whole life. Yeah? It's the, the diplomatic way. So you have to find a way to, to address the issue. Yeah? So that you say, that you find out why the person is acting in this way to you and make this person understand that you don't feel comfortable with this that you don't think that this is justified, that you feel it's not fair. Uh, and out of such a dialogue, um, which hopefully occurs in such a situation, but this is something we have to learn. Yeah? This third way, the way of diplomacy, the way of resolving and settling disputes or lat latent conflicts, this is something we should learn in school and universities uh, because it's not something which we, most of us, cannot do without a certain training. But these are the three basic ways to react to conflict. Okay. Any other question? Evaluation of what? Yes. Um, of a nation's action. Evaluation? Like, yeah, maybe you just Evaluate a nation's actions. A nation's action. Yes, yes. Okay, to evaluate a nation's action yes. in regard to what? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Again. Please had a set of object, objective criteria that can be used to evaluate a nation's actions being identified. If so, is it being used now? Okay. It's... <laughs> I, I, sorry, I'm very slow. English is not my language and it's also afternoon. I would like to sleep already. <laughs> so, but, um, so a criteria uh, to evaluate nations' actions. But uh, in some ways you did not let me know in which regard. Uh, so... Um, the, the, um, the, there are two parts of the question. The, the first part is something about a set of objective criteria. To evaluate nation's actions, yeah? But in general, I mean, to evaluate what kind of action of nation, this I did not get. Uh, well, For foreign policy, domestic policy. Um, any way uh, you would like to answer, to deliver the answer, <laughs> because this is a very broad question. 
Uh, you, so, I, I see, you have discovered already that I like to talk, so it doesn't yeah, matter uh, what you yeah, ask me, yeah, anyway, just to talk. Just aim okay. at us. <laughs> your, your Highness, with your no. permission, may I help my student? Okay. Uh, this is cooperation. I, I, yes. I think that uh, she, uh, what she's trying to say, she tries to ask you is that, uh, suppose you want to, uh, want, want to say, this nation's action is good, or this nation's action is bad, what is the criteria to use to judge? For example, if the American, new American policy uh, is to go on staying in uh, Iraq, how, how can we judge whether it is, it, it is good or is it bad? So what the criteria is? You know, thank you very much. It's a very good question. I, I just was slow, sorry. Um, this is the issue which became so famous now in the international discourse after or during the American uh, uh, presidential campaign and after the campaign when the world to a certain degree was astonished that President Bush was re-elected with such a majority. Yeah? And then the analysis started within the United States and outside the United States, how does it come that he was re-elected so strongly? And then they say it's moral values. So I at least get what the question is. I mean, the criteria of moral values and ethic values. But, you know, there are two ways to answer to this. Of course, we could be very philosophical, but I want to be more practical here. So, one way to look at actions of states is the following, also of, of individuals, by the way. Many think that the goal justifies the means. Now I get a little cynical, but if, and I think we all agree with what President Bush said in its inaugural speech, he did say to the world, we will bring now freedom and democracy to the world. We want to end tyranny. We want that the people are living in free societies that they can uh, pursue their own interests and so on and so on. So, when I heard this speech of President Bush, I said to my wife, I can underline and support each word of this speech of President Bush. So then I have to ask myself, but yet why I'm not happy? Yes, I'm not happy with this policy because the vision, the goal is right but the way to achieve it is not the way I would like to see it. So in other words, since you mentioned Iraq, I, I ask you back the question. Yeah? If you intervene in a country under false pretext, in other words, you lie to your people and say, we have to go and uh, intervene militarily in this country because of weapons of mass destruction. Then we find out that this was a false pretext. Then we change the argument and we say, well, actually we did go in not because of this purpose, but we did go in uh, because we want to have a regime change there. So, okay, we want to remove a bad dictator. Now then, we want to bring democracy there, yeah? But on the way of bringing freedom and democracy, we have to make a little war, yeah? And in this little war, we kill uncounted Iraqi civilians. Civilians which should be still alive today. They just wanted to have peace, and I'm not speaking about the so-called insurgents. I'm speaking about what is called collateral damage. Yeah? the casualties of war. And the American government and the Pentagon has even stopped long time ago to count this Iraqi uh, 
the, the dead Iraqi people, the, the, the Iraqi victims, yeah? because they have no interest on our way to freedom and democracy. So I think this is not the right way. So in other words, one criteria to look at actions of individuals or states is that we have to observe also the way how the goals are uh, achieved. And um, for me and many people it's quite clear that through war you can gain victory, but you can never gain peace. This is very important. I said it the other day where the, I gave a lecture in the National Defense College and, and uh, so uh, we discussed this, yeah, that with the means of war, with the means of violence, you cannot achieve peace, only victory. You can gain victory, yeah? So, I think what in, in, in the Christian book, in the Bible, is uh, uh, also mentioned, it's uh, on your fruits, on the fruits of their deeds, you will recognize them. That means, uh, you, if you want to achieve peace, you have to do it with peaceful means. You have to do it with appropriate means. Yeah? You can achieve peace only by being peaceful. You cannot achieve peace in a different way. And again, I'm, I, uh, to finish this uh, subject, I, if I'm very cynical, I don't say that this is the American foreign policy, but I just uh, say in a cynical manner, in general, in an abstract way, I could say a good way to achieve peace in the world is that we bomb everybody and everything until we are all dead, and then there's peace. Do you understand the point? It's not the right way. Yeah, We have to look for different means. And this is much more complicated, and uh, this is dialogue, this is negotiation, and this is mutual understanding, and this is love. This means we want to make each other happy, we will accept each other, we never stop to speak to each other. We continue to hope. Because in this world today, full of conflicts, and there will be more and more conflicts, unfortunately, as it looks now, if we don't put a stop on this, if we don't change from a culture of war to a culture of peace and to peaceful attitude, then we will enter into tremendous conflicts in the next decades. And the only way out is uh, this way of love and mutual understanding, respectful dialogue, uh, and uh, speaking to each other, listening to each other, understanding each other. Okay. Uh, to live with hope and peace is what we need, actually. Uh, is there any other question? In Oxford or Cambridge, it is very bad manners to refer to the rival university by name. One just says the other place. So I hope I cause no offense if I refer to Grand Canyon University, where you raised some interesting points yesterday. You regretted that there was no system better than the democracy. And English golf clubs have evolved a system which is better. They still have their committees of people who like to sit around and talk about things, but they appoint a small management committee actually to run the club, usually a chartered accountant, a lawyer, a horticulturalist, and a caterer with those sort of expertise, and the result is vastly improved management. Could it be said that the running of a country is too difficult and too important to be carried out by politicians. A second part of my question referring to yesterday is that you informed us of the new constitution in Liechtenstein and that any part of the country could declare itself independent. 
Many of the conflicts in the world are to do with the wish of a group to declare their independence. Could there be a United Nations formula for that with possibly a probationary period during which conflict could be resolved and a definition of the level of independence which might not include all aspects of government? Well, thank you very much. I start with the second part. I mentioned yesterday uh, that since last year, Liechtenstein has a new constitution, and part of this new constitution is the right, the full right of self-determination, even down to the level of the communes. So theoretically also, uh, as the, uh, His Excellency said in the beginning, Liechtenstein is a tiny, tiny little country, but yet we have a number of communes in this country. So to exemplify a new type of, in, of constitution, my cousin, the ruling prince, insisted very much to put into this new constitution the right of self-determination for each commune. So theoretically, in Liechtenstein, since last year, each commune can declare in a certain process based on the constitution its independence and can choose to create a new little state on its own, a baby, baby state, or to join another state, theoretically. So far, none of the Liechtenstein communes have done uh, this yet. Now, in regard to also what His Excellency said in the beginning, uh, in regard to the new world order, uh, Europe is currently probably the most exciting experiment on a large scale which is going on. Because what we have here is a geographical integration, an integration of markets, and it's a fast-growing market. As you know, now there's the debate about Ukraine and maybe Turkey. So if these two countries would come in, uh, uh, then we have another 150 million or so more population, so the markets would expand tremendously. But at the same time, we have many, many different languages. We have about 30 languages uh, in, uh, in Europe right now. And of course, within the European community, there is a heavy debate about the constitution of this European community and in which way we organize ourselves. Whether we are decentralized, whether we follow the Swiss model, for instance, or whether we are more centralized and follow another model. So, but what we, what we have to find a way in the European communities to preserve diversity, because we have so many different cultures and different languages in, in, in Europe. So we try to find a way, a balance between centralization and decentralization, unity and the preservation of diversity. Now, self-determination is a key to this, but the response of of it, of this question in Europe is the principle of subsidiarity. That means we have put in the draft of the constitution of Europe now this principle of subsidiarity, which means that every administrative and political decision should be done on the lowest possible level of responsibility. That means on the most local level to cover this issue. So the central government, so to speak, the headquarters, they should not be involved in affairs which are of such type that they can be handled on the local, on the decentralized level. This is the response to the question of preserving the diversity and yet being efficient. And in certain also mathematical models and so on, we can show that this is also the most cost-effective and the most efficient way. Because 
usually if you have a centralized government, how can they know in the center, in the headquarters, so to speak, what are the real needs and the necessities on the local level? The people on the local level, they know best how to organize this and how to handle it. So this, this is one part uh, to answer your question. Of course, what you touched can be stretched very much. Because if you look carefully at this right of self-determination, then you can say this right of self-determination is so crucial and compelling to many in the world and that they feel the means to achieve self-determination justifies the use of violence. And this is what we call freedom fighters or what we call terrorism. Because most of the movements which some of us call terrorists, if you would ask them whether they are terrorists, they will tell you no, we are just fighting for our freedom. We want our right of self-determination respected. So this is a, the right of self-determination is a very explosive issue. And therefore, actually, but I don't want to go in details, uh, also Liechtenstein did start, uh, but a number of years ago, an initiative here within the United Nations to debate the right of self-determination. And this is the background to the change of the Constitution because Liechtenstein wanted to show that you can put this in a Constitution. And actually Liechtenstein wants to be as a model here that the right of self, of peaceful self-determination should be put in every Constitution around the world. But of course, as you will understand, many of the big countries, they say we have no interest to put this in the constitution because we are afraid uh, that if we do this in Spain, if we do this in France, for instance, then the Basques will go away. If we do it in Turkey, then the Kurds will go away. If we do it in Iran, the Kurds will go away and maybe the Sheets will go to Persia and so on and so on. So because of fear that the status quo in the world will be destroyed. The right of self-determination is mainly denied to the people who would strive for self-determination. And now these people, in many cases, don't find any other way anymore than to raise their arms. And they say, well, then we will fight for this right of self-determination, and now they become freedom fighters, or in the eyes of the others, or some others, then they say, hey, they are destroying the integrity of our uh, territory, of our nation, and so on, and therefore we call them, we label them terrorists, and we will fight a bloody fight against them now, um, and this is a fight, a conflict of mutual annihilation. But as I pointed out before, that through war, through the, through the use of force, you can gain victory, you can kill each other, but you will not achieve peace. So the lawful use of force, the right of self-defense, the right of self-determination and terrorism is very close connected as subject. And uh, this is also really the main debate which is going on in the world now. To your first question, well, this is actually more or less the model of representative de democracy. Because what is representative democracy? It is like your golf club. We say, you know, we are a country, a nation, we are a society, a state, and we have so and so many people in population, but we cannot have a full self-rule. That means we need to appoint certain representatives which we elect, 
And these representatives elect again an executive body, and this is then the executive committee, and whether this is a golf club or whether you call it government, it's basically the same. And there are some countries uh, where the, uh, um, the, the head of the government uh, also looks at the, at the country like a company and says, I'm just the CEO of this company called so and so. Uh, and my ministers, uh, uh, they are uh, the board members and therefore I run the country as if it would be a company. So this is the system of representative democracy. But there are two countries in the world which have a different system currently, and this is Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And you might be astonished that Liechtenstein has uh, so many uh, features in all this tininess, but it's really interesting because you can experiment in such a small country. Yeah? But so Switzerland and Liechtenstein, these are not representative democracies, but direct democracies. That means in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, all major decisions are done directly by the population in forms of referendum. And so during the course of a year in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, there are a number of days where referendums are taking place. And then all the major foreign policy, economic policy, and other policy issues are put in front of the people and the people directly decide we are in favor of this initiative or we are against this initiative and this is the final word. So this is another model which is called direct democracy. Of course you have also a kind of executive committee which is the government and so on, but in Switzerland for instance it's a model where all parties are permanently represented in the government which is also very interesting. So of course, sometimes with uh, more or less ministers uh, or secretaries, but uh, they are always there because it's a different approach. It's not so much the majority rule, but the basic principle of uh, uh, the Swiss and uh, uh, idea is that we want to achieve consensus. Yeah? So, people elect different parties, but then all these parties in different uh, uh, proportions are represented in the government. And also, for instance, in Switzerland, you don't have a permanent president, um, but it's a rotating, uh, the, in this government, you have a speaker of the government, and this person is rotating. That means each year or second year, uh, and another speaker of this executive committee is called President of Switzerland. Okay, um, we still have more time. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate. I think there's... Okay, one, one more. Is yeah. Okay. So this will be the last question. Good afternoon, Your Highness. My name is Mano. I'm studying business in England. My question is, recently many conflicts are caused by people who use their power in the way. How can we solve this kind of problem? Thank you. You know, the the flaw of conflict resolution is that you can only settle a dispute or a conflict basically if both conflicting parties are willing to settle the conflict and are willing to settle it more or less peaceful. So if, if one or both of the two conflicting parties are not willing to resolve the conflict, it's very difficult to, to manage it. Then basically it's only possible through what we call the third party peacemaker in a role of a peacemaker, 
I mentioned this before, that a third party, which is a moral authority or an, has a power, political, military power, comes in and says, hey, enough is enough. Now I want that you sit together and I will force you to make peace. So this is, unfortunately, the nature of conflict and conflict resolution is such that you only can resolve a conflict if both parties are willing to do it. But of course there are very different ways to do it. So if only the two parties are involved, then you call it negotiations. Yeah? If the two conflicting parties are trying to resolve the conflict, this is a negotiation. Then you have other ways where third parties get involved in the resolution of conflict. And this, and I will not go into details now, but you call it in dependence of the level of involvement of the third party, you call it moderation, facilitation, mediation, or arbitration. And an arbitra is nothing else than a judge. Because what, is, what our courts are doing is conflict resolution. Two conflicting parties who are suing each other, yeah, because they cannot settle their conflict, so therefore they go to the lawyers, they sue each other, they go to a court, and then an arbitra called judge comes in, and this arbitra uh, then has the authority and uh, uh, that he can decide ultimately on this conflict. Yeah? He makes a resolution of the conflict by his power and because the two conflicting parties in advance say we will accept the decision of this arbiter. But of course you can have arbitration also outside the court through an arbiter which is called in by the two conflicting parties. But then there is another way which is called peacemaker and this is what I said and uh, before and then uh, the last possibility is what we call peacekeeping, peacekeeper. This is usually what the United Nations are doing, but this is a post-resolution situation. Either after a ceasefire is achieved between two conflicting parties, or a resolution has been achieved, and then the peacemaker just comes in to keep the conflicting parties separate so that new, not a new violent conflict can arise. But as I said, all this mainly basically works when, uh, when the conflicting parties are interested to settle their dispute and conflict. And therefore, let's say there are no, not many other means if, if one side uh, is insisting in the use of force then you can only resort to the uh, issue of self-defense or, or or you can start to pray. It's, you can try to convince. There's no other way. I'm sorry. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Your Highness, for your contribution. We have come to the end of the event, and I'd like to take this opportunity to call upon our distinguished president, uh, Dr. Narong Sinsua to present a token of appreciation to the keynote speaker and followed by the closing address. Thank you very much, Your Highness. I think all of us here, all the students, faculty members, and our guests, 
learn a lot, learn the culture of peace. Like that we we always think that uh, it's a small country by size and by population. But as you have witnessed today, the idea is not small. The idea is much bigger than many large nations. Example is Switzerland. Switzerland, which the citizen of Switzerland is the father of the Red Cross, which helped to elevate, to help, uh, help the soldiers who suffer in the wars, which by a much larger nations. So we have learned a lot. With the permission of Your Highness, I would like to summary, put the summary of what you have said in Thai language. ก่อนนะฮะผมคิดว่านักศึกษาคงได้เรียนรู้เยอะนะครับก่อนผมก็ขออนุญาตบางท่านส่วนใหญ่ก็คงจะเข้าใจที่เอ่อเอ่อพระ
Uwe Morovic. Thank you very much that you made today the event that happened. And also to uh, my own friend, Dr. Songkit Arya Prasya, who uh, tra traveled a long way from the other side of Bangkok uh, to here to, to be with us today. Thanks also to our staff who arranged all this for everyone uh, that uh, you made this event that we connect uh, long time, long time uh, take into the, uh, the memory of the history of our university. Thank you very much. On behalf of Southeast Asian University, we thank you for your time and hope to see you again at the very next series event on science and its relevance to international cooperation and a peaceful society delivered by another royalty keynote speaker from the U.S., Professor Baruch S. Gruber. The event takes place on Wednesday, March 23rd, here at the same venue and at the same time. Once again, thank you very much. Hope you have.